Hi, uh, are you enjoying your Python so far? Yeah. Okay. Um, are you getting inspired? Yeah, I guess. Are you like getting like you, we're going to apply everything we've learned uh, to to next week's work, right? <laughs> no, no, no fucking way. That's that. It's very difficult. Like no matter how incredible and how much we we keep on learning on these conferences. Um, there's always some blocker that um, prevents us from doing these amazing things in our job. And um, uh, I think the task of every speaker here should be to warn you into how much shit you're in. And that's why I'm here. Uh, I'm going to present you the actual problem in all its clarity and uh, hopefully uh, allow you to have some way out. So that's essentially the talk. Uh, but first of all, can you raise your hand if at work, you deal with data, like, <laughs> it's, it's a stupid work, right? Uh, instead, is anyone here, like, talking about CPU at work, like, optimization, that kind of stuff? Yeah, okay, right, not that many. Uh, I know it's a lot of the question, because um, uh, the thing is, um, the engineers that used to raise the most hands are the second question, and not the first one. So over the last 20 years or so, uh, lots of companies have sprung for which uh, data is a bigger challenge and not uh, CPU. Um, the tool that exemplifies the most probably is even Python, um, where we've released some control over how to uh, use memory management and that kind of stuff. And um, in exchange, what we get is a much more uh, control over our ability to glue things together uh, using the tool. Um, so. The problem essentially is that companies nowadays uh, deal with data rather than CPU. That the speed, its complexity, and the amount, and uh, how how difficult it is to to deal with it, and the speed of change. So, I'd say that um, it used to be the case that engineers become experts by mastering algorithms, data structures, and nowadays uh, we become experts by mastering the selection of tools that are most appropriate for this task. I'd say that a true engineer expert, it's someone who can uh, define what is the tool, the general purpose tool that is needed for a particular task. Um, however, we engineers face most of our engineer challenges uh, using tools that I feel, and I think you agree with me, that are a bit inflexible to changing and um, combining data systems. Um, it's as, it is as if we are, we are using the same data uh, persistent tools that we use from the very beginning. Like, that's, that's the deal. Whatever you choose at the beginning, that's what you, what you are with. And um, in a sense, it's as if we are, we are provided only with a hammer. And uh, obviously, we're puzzled when we realize that not every problem that we have in front of us looks like a nail. Um, so let me show you a concrete example of what I mean by that. And given that literally every company seems to be creating a social app nowadays, uh, let's have this quick uh, uh, thought experiment. Like, try to come up with the tools that you use at work um, with uh, how would you describe in code uh, the user class of a social media app. Like, try, try to envision that for just, just a sec. So let me show you what I think it's come up in your head. So probably there's something a lot like this. Probably this is not the tool that you use, the technology is maybe different, but essentially this is it. Um, this is called the active record pattern. And I'm, sh I'm gonna show you like in no time why uh, I hate it so much. Um, so it's, Incredible, nevertheless, that this active record, however much I hate it, and probably that's the reason I hate it so much, is that Vermada is SQL Alchemy, it's Django, it's uh, upon your um, it's Tortoise, it's Peewee, it's everywhere. Every ORM out there, at least in Python, probably somewhere else as well, they use these very same pattern to teach beginners how to develop uh, websites. Um, and, and I would say the engineers are not necessarily wrong when they choose the active record pattern, but um, they only work well when the problem is not very complex. Like, um, 
the tool is easy to build and understand, and that's a good, a good thing for, for developers that are just starting. But it only works well over time if you maintain a direct relationship between the objects and the database, essentially. So um, even though tools like Django, Flask, um, and whatever have become the de facto standard of uh, web development, they did so. Uh, they became so only because they made specific design choices that were um, aimed at emphasizing speed of development. So it's, in, a, in a sense, they, they worked, and they succeeded, and they become prevalent because they, they are quick start frameworks for developers. Uh, but however, past that cut over level, we experience what is, what is it, what is it, what is wrong exactly with, with these kind of tools, right? Um, most engineers, even experts, it's not, it's not a matter of uh, seniority, realize uh, the, the, the hole they're in. Um, they find themselves unable to make progress, and uh, even though they were told to choose boring technology because they wanted to avoid these unknown unknowns that we are also told, they fall into problems that are essentially way too familiar. And um, yeah, that's essentially the problem with um, decision making under certainty, is that it's dominated by information that you don't have yet. Um, the, 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 what matters is what hasn't happened. And um, it's, it's like the, the, that, that quote by Steve Jobs, right? The, the connecting the dots, you recall that all? Obviously you do. Um, you can only do that in retrospect. So um, to give some context of what I meant by the social media app and why this is a problem, um, so Rafi Krikorian, which was uh, the, uh, we used to be VP or platform engineer, has a great talk called uh, Timelines at Scale, in which he, he essentially um, claimed that the problem that Twitter faced as they were scaling wasn't uh, the amount of people writing new, new tweets in, into, the, into the system, but alas, uh, the inability of the system as it's at scale to, um, to show the home query page, the home, the home timeline page, to a lot of people who follow a lot of people. So let me explain what I mean by that. So there are at least two ways in which you can um, architect a social media app. One, essentially, is the one we just come up with, the Tabrego pattern, which is what makes it easy to, read, to, to write into the database. Essentially, you write a new, a new, a new tweet, and it gets stored in the database, and it's related by a primary key, obviously, to the, to the user that posted it, and um, via the follow-we uh, follow relationship, the many-many table, we're allowed to show this information to every user when, when, they, when they go to the homepage. Um, another way that you can do this um, is by making things easy to read. And the way they achieved that in, in Twitter was to maintain some sort of cache for each single user, uh, sort of a mailbox if you want to like, have a me clear metaphor what I mean by that, in which every time a tweet was written into the system, uh, what they did was to fan out that tweet and copy it into every follower's uh, timeline, so that next time he would go to the home query page, the, to the home, uh, to home line page, what they would get is from this cache all the tweets ordered. And um, yeah, essentially what, we, what Twitter did was to control more granularly how data is read and written on the database. So the problem essentially is that the soundness of this choice comes down not to what happened at the beginning or how easy it was to develop at the beginning, but essentially this very rate between how many tweets are read versus how many tweets are written on the, on, on the system. And the fact that the writes went on the order of the ten, on the thousands, whereas the reds were on the order of the hundreds of thousands made the key difference, essentially. Um, so the question, from, the question remains, essentially, like, how would you how would you go after you know that information? How would you go about migrating from this active record pattern to something else, to this uh, other strategy? Yeah, you can. That's essentially the problem. You can't unless you just throw it away and start over. You see the problem, right? Um, 
it makes it impossible to shift to a new information, to, to accommodate a new information that you have about how the system is used. And your only way out is essentially to throw it away and start over, which is obviously no good idea. Because in the meantime, what you're left is with a system that hasn't scaled, the problem has already arrived at your door, and your only solution is to have something in parallel, to like try to accommodate these as far as they can, and then you have the migration of having two systems operating at the same time, and uh, in the meantime, this active record is unable to serve the home queries. Hopefully, people are, uh, recall what this is, right? So this is exactly this, this very problem. This is what happened to Twitter. And this is what we are bound as software engineers every single day because of, because of the active record pattern. The fail whale, as it came to be known, um, showed us exactly what is the root of the, of the problem. When the requirements of the database, or the data system, so to say, changed, active record uh, prevents us from moving to an uh, unsuitable uh, architecture to a one that is more suitable to, to the task. Um, engineers that choose the active record may be optimizing for quick wins, but they do so at the expense of more rigidity at the data system level. They get to develop a relational data model that is fast to implement, but they're stuck with it. So it's, it's like, it's okay if, if, you, if you use the active record for simple projects. It's, I don't have anything against that, but in a larger sense, uh, we cannot dedicate ourselves to solve the, um, the impotence mismatch between objects and the database. We cannot consecrate the mediocre state of a system and just avoid touching it because, yeah, uh, I don't want to bring production down. And we cannot hallow the great read write as the only solution that we have to, uh, to accommodate an early uh, database decision that proved to be uh, in <laughs> not good, so to say. Um, so from this humble stand, what I can do is ask you to join me in declare these systems free and independent from all allegiance to early database decisions. What, what, I can, what I want you to have instead is rather than depending on an architecture that is rigid from the very beginning just because you needed to have something quick, um, I want you to aspire to engineer systems that are modular, where the value of the technical platform comes not from the capabilities that you are provided with, but with the ability to migrate into something else that might be more suitable in the future. Um, in, in doing so, decisions about how data system works can always be reverted when new information comes along. And um, in a world where um, we constantly iterate in order to find product market fit, it's, it just stands to reason that we do the same with data systems. We have the ability to change our minds uh, later on in, when in new information comes along. Um, so this is what the, what the concept of persistent ignorance essentially means, is that we architect the systems in such a way that the rest of the application behaves as if all the data is in memory. And uh, we, we find a way to encapsulate all the database or data system related decisions in one single place uh, so that everything else is abstracted from the fact that there's even a database to begin with. So that's essentially the talk that I'm going to be uh, talking today. Uh, my name is Salvador Duran, and um, this talk is called Working in Units, which is the name I came up with to describe this way of doing things that um, maybe uh, will provide you with wins that are probably less quick, as you would expect. But in exchange, what you would have is something that I believe is a very specific need that all people here have which is the ability and the flexibility to change data systems. So in order to do that, um, what I'm going to do is something that I do believe it is controversial. So um, what I'm going to do is invert the relationship between the database and the, and the, and the objects. So um, this is essentially what is, what is going on. So rather than declare 
with the active record how the database operates, what we're going to do is to specify exactly and with precision what it means to change from the, data, the, 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 the database to the object in, in our domain. Um, so we use this imperatively approach to admit a bit, probably a bit more complexity because of this extra layer, but in exchange what we get is the, the two, these two levels, object and database, operate relatively independent from each other. So essentially, we're shifting from one, uh, uh, from one pattern to another called data mapper. And um, presumably you haven't heard from it. Even experts are not even aware of these data, the, the state design pattern, um, specifically because of these um, a special effort that you need to have to treat these, um, these two levels uh, as coherent with each other, but at the same time independent. So it's, it puts pressure on your expertise to manage this relationship rather than just declare it and forget about it. But in exchange, what we get is that we treat the classes in our domain as something entirely different from database rows. And that allows us to do all these sort of tricky things that we are being taught during this conference and we are so inspired to, to apply it right away. Unless we, we architect things to be independent from uh, the database, what we are bound with is to treat objects in, in our code as they, if they were rows in the database. And there's no way that doing some fancy tricks with um, uh, object-oriented object programming is going to do, is gonna do it. It's, 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 gonna, it's bound to fail, essentially. Um, so yeah, um, the class that is going to handle this relationship, uh, rather than just declare it, and we're going to make use of it, is this called repository. Essentially, it's just a class that um, centralize the methods from which we obtain and we update the database with new instances. I'd put an example. It, it, this is not really write up like production like code, but the essentially the essence of the of the class is essential. Essentially, that you have the ability to create stuff in the database and get stuff back from the database, but always shown in terms of domain classes rather than uh, models from the database. Um, However, the, the repository pattern on itself is not enough. Um, because of this extra layer, what you need is somehow to address the problem of concurrency. And um, in a sense, what we would, uh, what we would do if it's, if it's just the repository going on is um, that we will have to be constantly trying to keep things in sync all the time. And that will defeat the purpose of behaving as if everything is in memory. You, are, you will be clearly exposed to the idea that there's concurrency going on and database involved, and that defeats essentially the purpose. So what we're going to do, rather than figure skating on the age of concurrency, what we're going to do is present a context manager called unit of work, which obviously that's the reason why the, this talk is called uh, working in units, um, in which what we're going to do is define the moment where uh, what is going to happen when a commit or a rollback happens. But it can do more than that. It can open the, the connection, it mitigates the concurrency, uh, the concurrency problems with isolation levels, and it can also uh, write down things very efficiently. Like at the end of the context manager, we write everything down on the database and we're good to go. That's essentially what makes it so efficient. Uh, but more importantly, we are as in the rest of the code is essentially abstracted from the idea that there's even a database. What I mean by that is that if, if the user posts a tweet in the database, the, the unit of work opens up the connection, relies on the repository to provide this information back and forth from the database. In this case, it might be even posting it to the mailbook of, of tweets that I was mentioning uh, before. And then it goes back so that the next time the guy goes on the home uh, page of Twitter, they uh, open the connection with uh, the unit of work, go back to the repository that is associated with that context, and uh, it might uh, re retrieve that information either from the, from the cache or from the database, which is the final twist of this situation. What I mean by that is that Twitter and any social media app there's two kinds of people, so to say. There's the people who are followed by millions and hundreds of millions, and uh, well, there's millions of others like me, I guess. Um, uh, the problem with these is that if you try to mailbox tweets from these widely followed people, 
uh, you're going to run into problems with resource intensity. Uh, you, it, there's no way you can uh, copy paste tweets to the mailbox of hundreds of thousands of followers. So instead, what you do is you merge that information directly from the database. It's way more, way more cost efficient to do so. So the thing is that um, these guys are getting a different treatment just because they're celebrities. Not, not in terms of real world, although that's the case, but also in terms of how the information that they, they post on Twitter gets, uh, gets um, fanned out to the rest of the, of, the, of the followers that they have. So the tricky thing about, thing, the, about this, and what's so remarkable, is that we've achieved precisely these, these this scenario that was ideal, I, I believe, is that given a new piece of information, uh, I, I believe it's sensible to see that uh, the implementation of this hybrid approach will rely entirely within the context and the boundaries of the repository, and not gonna, it's not going to be scattered across the, across the whole system, which leads me to believe that this is the, exactly the core advantage of this design system, the ability to change your mind without changing too much, too much code. And so uh, for those of you who are interested in reading more about these or even like getting inspired, as I said, to uh, try some, some of these ideas, I would suggest these three, these three um, sources. The first one is Architecture Pattern in, in, with Python, in which most of these ideas are discussed in the context of domain-driven design. The second one is Designing Data-Intensive Application, uh, Page Turner, if you ask me. Um, in which the, the, the book is all about how to navigate the landscape of these new data systems that have come across over the, these last 20 years. And that will inform your decision making about what is the best data system for the task. And um, last but not least, uh, the, old, the good old patterns of enterprise application architecture, in which the design patterns that I've discussed are uh, described in more detail. Uh, so yeah, um, I'm going to be available on, on the Discord channel, but also you can ping me on, on Twitter. And um, I also have a Substack in which I discuss most of these ideas in the context of um, payments and the travel, it's travel agency industry. So thank you so much. So uh, thank you very much. And we have a bunch of time for the questions, so just queue up to the microphones and... Oh, actually, while you do, maybe can you describe what's the basically difference between unit of work pattern and session in the database? Um, so that's, a, that's actually a very good question, honestly. Um, what's so interesting about this question is that the session is indeed a unit of work. Um, uh, SQL Alchemy, for some reason, uh, used this pattern in the beginning. It's, it's called classical mapping in the documentation. You can, you can look it up. Uh, but uh, they ditched it, or at least they are now masquerading it with some meta programming so that they can use the active, the active record pattern. I believe what happened essentially was that they realized that unless they provide this active record option for younger or more beginners uh, developers, they couldn't reach like market adoption in a way. So they had to deal with this pattern. But the, the question remains, what happens, what happens when I want to move beyond uh, hobbyist projects? Um, SQL Alchemy provides you with the option, but uh, the documentation is like in the background, you know what I mean? Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. It was nice. Uh, I have a question about, about the internals of the pattern. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning that you would like the business logic to operate as if all the objects were essentially in memory and uh, do, them, do it via domain uh, defined uh, objects and types. Uh, so whenever you open this context manager for the unit of work and then you manipulate objects, you need to somehow track the changes mm -hmm. in order to efficiently uh, reflect them in your storage system when the unit of work is done. Yes. So, right. uh, how would you go about that? So, uh, I mean, there's a whole uh, 
there's a whole new, um, not industry, but a whole new group of people dedicated entirely to this idea. Um, so it's, it's essentially what I was describing with the problem with figure skating in the age of concurrency. If, if you're trying to make changes while someone else is doing changes from a different server or a different thread, you run the risk of pr producing race conditions or these, 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 these stuff that might happen when, when you open the connection, but you haven't closed it yet. What happens while this stuff is going on, right? Um, so, there's, so there's documentation on SQL Alchemy, for instance, which is the one that I'm most familiar with, and I can share with you uh, it after the, after the talk. Uh, but it's all about isolation levels, um, which essentially means that the session uh, should be clever enough to figure out uh, how uh, transactions uh, interchange information between each other at the moment of the commit and uh, how they, they interact when they are together. I can share more information with you later on, don't worry. Right, but um, I wasn't asking specifically about SQL and relation databases. So what happens if your data store is something else, like files or whatever, and then uh, you want to save the changes that you made to the objects in memory, and you need to know what the changes are, and how do you know that? Um, so, in terms of document, I'm not really familiar with the non-SQL database. I'm not really an expert. Uh, but I'm sure there must be a way in which you can do that. The thing with uh, document database is that they, they put more pressure on the application code and the integrity is, um, is handled by the application rather than the database, so to say. So I would, I would say that the long story short is that it's your job to, do, to make sure that that's the case. Okay, thanks. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, do you have any advice, let's say, you wanted to implement this in an existing project okay. with like loads and loads of database access yeah. all over the place. How would you like start? Um, like okay, so first things first, uh, I really like your talk that you gave last, uh, yesterday. <laughs> um, so the problem, the problem is essentially how you migra migrate from what you have to, to these. And um, I honestly have, I don't think I have a, a good answer at this point. What I would say is that um, what I would say that I would start with trying to replicate this in what you have, and eventually these um, these concepts should emerge somehow naturally. Uh, without more specifics about what the system you're operating in, I cannot give a proper answer. But um, but yeah, I encourage you to try, and um, maybe you can give a talk next year about how you did it. <laughs> I actually, I actually was one of the technical reviewers on that book, the first one, and I have tried, and we have done some of this. Okay. It, uh, so um, we have like a big Django code base mm -hmm. with like 27,000 modules, many, many, many models, um, and we, yeah, we've definitely got some way, but like I don't think we've got to the point of being able to have repositories. Mm -hmm. We've got use cases, um, but no further. Looking forward to have a conversation with you yeah. and uh, so Maybe that you can explain year. to me what you did and how, how it worked. Okay, we have time for one short question, like one minute. Okay. Hi, Alvaro. Hi, how's it going? Cool. Yeah, very well. I enjoyed your talk. For years, we Python developers, superior Python developers, have ridiculed Java developers and C-sharp developers to writing a bunch of boilerplate code to transfer user as a database user, to a user as a business user, to a user as a front-end presentation layer user. Yeah. Yes. What you are suggesting here is essentially going to back to that concept, at least partially. So, uh, or more or less, you know, like that's, that's an assumption. So how would you respond to this critique? Because I don't feel like it's entirely true, but I would like to hear it from you. Like, what, how is what you are proposing different from what these inferior inferior Java and C sharp developers have been doing for years okay um, thanks for your question um, I, I think I think it's a good question because it, it, it shows that um, there's been a failure to understand uh, uh, what is the difference between uh, how database operate and how object oriented programming can happen within that context and that's essentially what happened uh, without the ability to use uh, domain classes truly as objects 
and apply Python stuff with it, you are incapable of doing all the stuff that you mean. And uh, that's why it proved inferior. Um, so yeah, uh, only by, so I'd say that rather than going back to what you're saying is essentially this talk, these, these ideas, what allows you to do is what you actually were trying to do in the first place but failed to do. It makes sense to me, thank you. Thank you very much, let's get a round of applause.